that night of the 17th, I sent him on some errands, but he also told me that he's going to play with his friends like they always did. Always used to play touch rugby and street and whatever. And I told him he can come in late, but not that late. Um, nine o'clock, didn't come home yet. I started to get worried, 10 o'clock. Um, I wanted to go look for him. I actually went to go stand at the gate. Didn't see anything like normally him and his friends were sitting on the corner or still playing. And I stood outside at the gate. There was nobody. Went in again. And I actually contemplated should I go look for him. But then I'm going to have to leave his little brother at home alone. And I couldn't do that. And I was also scared to walk alone because it was dark already. <sighs> Eventually I slept with the light on dozed off, woke up again, lowly, and so the night went, I actually didn't sleep much that night because, yeah, because Lee would always come home, always. Lee was, Lee's name at school was Joker. <laughs> he was always the one making jokes and fun in class, and he was always, yeah, and Lee had lots of friends since he was little and then I would see this face and that face and that face but I always had lots of friends and as he was very strong walled but he loved people most of Lee's life it was me and him and nobody else and nobody knows what bond we shared what me and him went through <laughs> I don't want to see what the perpetrator look like I don't, maybe one day when I'm good and ready but I don't want to see what it look like and I don't know what I'm going to do if I will actually see him one day or see his face or come to face to face with him because I hate him and nobody's going to tell me not to because there's only one person that can judge me and that's God and there's yeah and nobody's gonna tell me not to hate him because I do and he pleaded guilty I don't know if I should be happy or sad about it or I actually don't know what to feel because at the end of the day my son is gone nothing is ever 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 gonna bring him back and we goes to what I hope he'll get is I hope he dies I wouldn't say I hope he gets life in prison because that's not what I want. I hope he dies a slow and painful death and that is how I feel. And I hope he goes through what my son had to go through in that last moment. <laughs> What up home slices, what up home fries, and what up homes of other varieties. So if you are new, welcome. I'm Emily the Fine Art Medium. I'm a psychic medium who specializes in the paranormal and has a degree in social deviance. And with this case, I believe this is the first case that we will be doing. It might be the only case as well that is outside of the United States and is in South Africa. And the reason why I wanted to do this case was just because of how appalling it was and just like weird and I don't know. There was just a lot of what the heck's in this case. So I'm going to jump right into the case and what it's about. And yeah, so we have Aljar, and I'm probably saying it wrong, Aljar Swartz. So he was a 17 year old who was arrested on October 20th, 2013. And you might be asking, for what crime did he commit? Well, 
So he was convicted of the gruesome beheading of a 15-year-old, Lee Adams, at an abandoned school. And he lured the kid there. And uh, he... First, they were going to smoke some daga there. However, events then turned for the worst when he stabbed him numerous times, then strangled him, and then finally decapitated him. But then you might ask, why did he decapitate him? Because he wanted to sell his head for a quick buck, and he was going to sell it to a um, spiritual healer, but in their neck of the woods, they're more so witch doctors. But, um, yeah, so the person who did the crime was 17 years old in 11th grade. And, uh, yeah. And what's worse is it was a friend of his that was from Florida Primary. And, yeah, what the heck? With the laws there, the Child Justice Act was applicable which meant that the offender could not be tried as, I guess, as an adult or be declared as a dangerous criminal and could not be sentenced for more than 25 years. But the problem is, I mean, in the United States, he would have been trialed as an adult. But here, he showed no empathy or compassion or remorse. And he claims that he was under possession of demons. So he was then taken to a forensic psychologist, which they deemed him to have a psychopathic personality and that he was manipulative and could be charming. And the psychologist further testified there was little chance of rehabilitation in Swartz's case and recommended his sentencing report be made available when a parole board one day reviews the case. And he was the type of person that was extremely manipulative, was a liar, and stopped at nothing to reach his goals. Now, when he brought the claims up of being possessed by a demon, of course nobody believed him. He had had a prior conviction of, I believe, theft. And the weird thing is, the defense here wanted to have an exorcism or deliverance record it and then put it up for the defense and so they would have like proof or testimony that he was fine because after he had his exorcism he was now like oh I'm okay now but yeah his lawyer asked the Western Cape High Court to facilitate his exorcism Lawyer Sheriff Mohammed said it was of great concern that Swartz suffered from demonic forces. He asked Judge Elise Sten to make an order that would facilitate an exorcism at his prison. And then seemingly taken aback, she said, I have never heard of such an order. I don't know nearly enough about that to order such a thing. Then it was said that the defense will take urgent steps to have an exorcism procedure carried out and to have it videoed. Mohammed told News 24 afterwards that he planned to show the video during sentencing arguments. Swartz was found guilty of premeditated murder and three counts of incitement to commit murder. And like I said earlier, he tried to sell the head of the victim to a Sonoma, which is a witch doctor or spiritual healer. And then later a security guard found the boy's body at the abandoned school in Ravensmead. The head was later found in a shallow grave in the accused's yard. In a supporting affidavit handed up to court, he recommended that he perform an urgent deliverance session, which, guys, if you don't know the difference between a deliverance and exorcism, exorcism is like the Catholic version, and then the deliverance is like a Christian version, though I feel like the Deliverance Christian version is kind of less. It's not as like, I don't want to say it's not as strong because they both can be helpful and do almost the same exact thing. One just has more to it than the other, really. And then after that, this was after Swartz confided in him about how demons continue to torture him. He was told how a demon appeared in his cell as a big black long lizard. 
At other times, it was a demon in his chest which could easily control him. Begbie said Swartz had told him he accepted responsibility for what happened because it was his own fault he got into Satanism. Okay, so he was also into Satanism. But he would never have done something so bad in his right mind or natural state. Begbie believes Satan and demonic forces had used Swartz's body as a vessel to carry out the murder. The court heard on Monday that Swartz had one previous conviction of robbery from 2011 at the time he was sentenced to three years in jail, wholly suspended on certain conditions. Swartz would remain in custody until his next appearance on April 28th. Again, this was in 2013. Yeah, now we're going to talk about this. Can negative entities, demons, attachments, negative earthies, anything negative, can it get a person to commit murder? The answer to that is yes. Can negative attachments get people to commit any kinds of crimes? Yes. But now the question is, was this the case for Mr. Swartz? Was he under demonic possession? Oof, this is tough because just looking at his picture, I already saw a black aura around him. And seeing a black aura around a person, even when people have attachments, their auras aren't usually black like that. Like his was black. I've seen some grays. I've seen some like dark, murky, purples, browns, but never in my right mind have I seen like black black his was black and actually there's one time that i saw something similar not exactly it was almost black but it wasn't black and it was when i was in this hotel with my husband and we were getting on an elevator and there was this guy i don't know if he was like a custodian or what i think he w he was somebody who worked at the hotel his aura was pretty dark. It was like a dark gray, but it wasn't pitch black like this guy's. So there's something definitely going on. Now, when you come into contact with a psychopath, people can be born a psychopath. Typically, they are born that way. Yeah, you can get it learned from your environment, but that would make you more a sociopath. Psychopath, yeah, more or less kind of like born that way. And you don't show remorse. And yeah, I mean, attachments can do that to a person. But we don't know much about his background. We just know what pretty much I just read to you guys. So we don't know what his life was growing up. Or, I mean, technically he's still a child. At least here in the United States, he's considered a child because he's under the age of 18. But we don't know what his upbringing is like or was like. We don't know if there was any abuse in the family. We don't know if he had any traumatic events that may have triggered this personality or behavior. But honestly, from what I was seeing from his aura, and auras can become certain colors based off of a person's personality, traits, like what they do in life, their traumas, their um, chakras, like if they have any blockages or if they have any overworking chakras, um, attachments can murky some of those up. If you're sick mentally or physically, it can alter what your aura looks like. His was black, pitch black. So that tells me there's something really bad going on here. And it's possible to have an attachment and have a person that's a psychopath simultaneously. It's, yeah, this case is complicated due to the lack of information that we have. However, I channeled information to see what is going on. All right, so I was actually able to get information very quickly when I channeled for this person. And yes, black aura, but I also was getting like a dull stomach pain, head pain. 
His energy exudes confidence, which is not typical for someone, A, his age, and B, for the situation he's in. It's very strange. I think there's definitely something evil at play, but the exorcism or deliverance did not work. He is using it as an excuse because he got caught and using the exorcism as a manipulative technique to avoid consequences. He doesn't... Yeah, it might be a little, like, unsettling that he's saying things, but he doesn't necessarily care. I don't know. It's just, like, I don't feel fear from him. I don't feel depression, sadness. I don't feel anything that I would say a typical person, especially someone his age, would be feeling or the position he's in. I will say if he gets out... He might act in accordance to societal norms temporarily, but eventually he's gonna slip up because he's not gonna be able to help it. I also suspect that he does have antisocial personality disorder. And if you don't know what antisocial personality disorder is, I'll tell ya. And the source here, I'm just going to get it off Mayo Clinic, just so you guys have a source to look at if you are curious. So, antisocial personality disorder, sometimes called sociopathy, is a mental health condition in which a person consistently shows no regard for right and wrong and ignores the rights and feelings of others. People with antisocial personality disorder tend to purposely make others angry or upset and manipulate or treat others harshly or with cruel indifference. They lack remorse or do not regret their behavior. He don't regret his behavior. He just is annoyed that he got caught. People with antisocial personality disorder often violate the law, which so far he already had a prior conviction of robbery becoming and becoming criminals. They lie, behave violently or impulsively, and have problems with drug and alcohol use. So far, we don't know anything about drug or alcohol use, although they said DAGA. I don't know what DAGA is. Let's look that up real quick. Oh, it's cannabis. Okay. Um, some people don't regard weed or cannabis as a drug. However, it is an illegal substance in many um, countries and in the United States in many states. So different parts of the world, it is illegal. So I guess you can consider that a drug thing. They have difficulty consistently meeting responsibilities related to family, work, or school. Symptoms of antisocial personality disorder include repeatedly ignoring right and wrong. Check. You can check that off the list. Telling lies to take advantage of others. You can check that off the list. Not being sensitive to or respectful of others. Check that off the list. Using charm or wit to manipulate others for personal gain or pleasure. <clears throat> you can check that off the list. Having a sense of superiority and being extremely opinionated. I don't know much about that for him. Having problems with the law, including criminal behavior. Check. Being hostile, aggressive, violent, or threatening to others. Ch -ch 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 check. Feeling no guilt about harming others. Check. Doing dangerous things with no regard for the safety of self or others. Check. Being irresponsible and failing to fulfill work or financial responsibilities. We don't have that information. Adults with antisocial personality disorder usually show symptoms of conduct disorder before the age of 15. Symptoms of conduct disorder include serious ongoing behavior problems such as aggression towards people and animals, destruction of property, lying and dishonesty, theft, serious violation of rules. Now... His first um, conviction with robbery, I don't know how old he was. I want to say, no, I don't, I'm not even going to guess. But um, it was before he was 17, so I'm assuming. But yeah, I mean, he's got quite a few of these already. 
Antisocial personality disorder is considered a lifelong condition, but in some people, certain symptoms, particularly destructive and criminal behavior, may decrease over time. It's not clear whether this decrease is a result of the effect aging has on their mind and body, an increased awareness of the impact that antisocial behavior has had on their life, or other factors. Honestly, if you were going to ask me, I feel like it has more to do with not because they don't want to do crimes and all that stuff. I think it's just more of them wanting to avoid consequences because it's just annoying, really. And they don't want to have to deal with that. And I feel like that's more of the thing. If they know that they're not going to get caught, I'm pretty sure they're just going to uh, do that behavior. So... Yeah, this thing isn't very curable. It can be managed with medication, but it cannot be cured. Um, yeah, there's... Now, here's the thing, guys. I've talked to Satanists face-to-face, -face, in person, and depending, because you have some Satanists that do it for, I don't know, it's kind of more of the philosophical they'll just say oh it's philosophical and I like the aesthetic and they're not really practicing like dark occult magic and then you have those that actually practice dark occult magic so it's like depending on where they fall can like dictate on if they have attachments the type of attachment how severe the attachment um their aura a lot of the philosophical ones I've met face to face energetically there, it's not great, it's not great, but it's not like this guy, um, it's not always super, like, dark, it's not necessarily evil, okay? You could have some Satanists that are not evil, duh, that's the same thing with pretty much anything, really, um, then you can have those that practice in the occult, and they're doing dark magic and stuff, and their auras are still pretty dark. I've seen some with the dark purples. I've seen them with like dark reds, really dark grays, but never black. I feel like for him, it has to go with A, his personality type, and B, the type of attachment that he has. And because most people aren't socio or psychopaths, that's why you're not gonna see that level of darkness in most auras. Now, that's just my symbology and how I interpret things. That's how spirit shows me things. My symbols might mean something different to other people, especially other mediums, because of how they have their key. And when I say key, I mean like their meanings and their symbols, like they could have them set up differently. But that's how I have mine set up. Again, everyone's different and you can have your own meanings for your own symbols. But that's Spirit's way of showing me how things are. Because that's just, they use your life experiences, your base knowledge, your current knowledge, your new knowledge, whatever. And yeah, that is based off of my personal toolkit. So yes, keep that in mind. And yeah, I definitely see something very negative sitting with him. It's very shadowy. I'm not seeing any forms. It's just as black as his aura though. So that could also contribute to the black aura that I'm seeing is because the entity is pitch black. Even when the entity is separated from him, the aura is still black. And so I feel like, again, it's they're using his antisocial personality and then you have that demonic like attachment I don't want to say it's a demon without doing a hundred percent like channeling and going fully in depth but because I have a lot of cases to go through I'm not diving extremely deep into otherwise we'd be here for like hours and hours and hours but yeah so I definitely feel like it's probably well balanced between paranormal attachment and mental health. I feel like the attachment 
might be more geared to influencing and pushing the person into doing certain behaviors that he might not have done because of the consequences. Like, he, he knows... I don't want to say he doesn't know right from wrong. Like, people know right from wrong. They just don't feel, the like, what's right and wrong. But through learning through society, because these kinds of people are really good at mimicking and mirroring, um, what's the word, behaviors and actions and things to fit in. That's why they're really good manipulators. They're really good at fitting into society because they're learning how to do so. So they know in accordance to society what is considered right and wrong. They just don't feel it. They don't have that empathy. So I feel like on his own, he's probably like, mm, I shouldn't do that. Society wouldn't like it, even though I personally don't care. And then the attachment's like, nah, you gonna do it. Doesn't matter. It's just like the, literally, the devil on his shoulder saying, nah, it's fine. So I feel like even though he had that, per he has that personality, allegedly, because I am not someone who can diagnose somebody. I don't have a license, so please keep that in mind. But... I feel like even though he allegedly has that personality disorder, he still knows what to do and what not to do. It's just the attachment kind of like, eh, pushed him to do it in a way. But the exorcism and deliverance, it didn't work. And it's not going to work unless he wants it to go away. And even then, it'll be a beach, especially if he continues to practice Satanism, and we don't know, like, what he's done. I suspect, and this is alleged, again, this is my opinion, I suspect that he's tortured some animals along the lines, and he's done some really bad shit, he just didn't get caught yet. And robbery, he might have gotten caught that one time, but he's done some other things, allegedly, that he just hasn't gotten caught for I think it would be a mistake to let him out, personally, especially if he has this type of disorder because you cannot heal from it and he has no signs of remorse. I don't know. I just feel like he's a risk. And I'm not saying everybody with this personality type is a risk to society. People have ways of managing it. People go to therapy and they deal with it. But... In his case, I think his urges are a little bit stronger, plus the attachment. He'll do something bad again. And, like I said, I feel like there's some things that they just haven't found yet that he's done. And yeah, that's my opinion there, guys. If you're gonna be able to go as far as to unalive your friend, your friend and decapitate them and try to sell their head for a quick buck. You couldn't like, I don't know, knit some shit and try to sell it. Like you had to go to the most far extreme to get a buck. So yeah, I, mm, yeah, I would not let him out personally. And maybe they need to do an evaluation on him and get him proper medical treatment for his mental health situation. And until they do that, I definitely wouldn't let him out. Like, they need to have a system put in place to regulate his activities. And I'm not saying that it's impossible that no matter what, they shouldn't let him out. I just think if they're going to go through the procedure in which they're currently working on, then no. But unless they get him help and get him the type of medication, all that stuff needed to make him um, fit more into society and keep him from doing harmful things, that's the only way he could, he could technically be fine being let out, but I don't foresee them really going too far 
in trying to do that. So that's why I'm kind of adamant of keeping him uh, there. But because when he was tried, he can't be in there for more than 25 years, they're going to let him out anyway. So it doesn't matter what I say. He's getting out in, I don't know, 22 years from 2013. So, yeah. But guys, what do you think? Do you have an opinion on this? Do you think this was pure mental health? Do you think this was paranormal? Both? What do you think? Put it down below. So, just when I had this video pretty much edited and done, I received a fucked up download and yeah about the events that occurred and they were graphic um and I could see it from the victim's point of view and it it was bad it was really bad um, and just watching someone claiming to be a friend do that to you or to the victim, no, no, fuck that, fuck that, like, no, and he did not care, there was no remorse, he was, um, unrelenting, he was very thorough, in a way like it there was no hesitation so I kind of just want to say that I'm sticking with what I said and what I feel with this person I don't think you should get out and I don't even know if therapy will even help him just because of what I saw so yeah, I could feel everything the victim could feel while simultaneously looking also through the eyes of Mr. Swartz. And so I was experiencing both at the same time. It's no, nothing can prepare you for some of the things that you see like as a medium when you experience a person's death or you experience it from a third person point of view, how fucked up and how grotesque and how gory that sometimes these situations are, you can be di desensitized from movies and even like if you live in a bad part of town and you're used to crimes and stuff, but when you're in it and you're face to face, it's a completely different animal. And what this person did was extremely inhumane. And I feel for the family. I feel for the mother who lost her son. I feel for the brother, the younger brother of the victim. Like, yeah, that's all I'm going to say here. And yeah, guys, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you all soon. Peace.